Bible with you, I want you to go ahead and turn to uh, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to read verses. I know it says on your roadmap we're going to read verse 1 to 21, but um, we're not. We're just going to read until verse 14. Philippians chapter 3, uh, starting at verse 14. Furthermore, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again and again and again and again. Paul has no problem telling the people he's writing to what he's about to tell them and and us. It's no problem for me to write these to you because it's a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it's we who are the circumcision, we who are served by God, uh, who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. What he means by that is we put no confidence in our own ability to do good things. Though I myself have reason for such confidence. If someone else thinks that they have reasons to put confidence in their own flesh and their own good works, Paul says, I've got more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm of the people of Israel. I'm the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, uh, I was a Pharisee. As for zeal, I persecuted the church. As for righteousness based on the law, I was faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider them loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained all of this. And not that I've already arrived at my goal. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do know, uh, I'm forgetting what is behind. I'm straining toward what's ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for uh, your written word copied down, passed down throughout the ages to give us hope, to give us life, and to give us the truth, not only about Jesus, but the truth about who you are and what you think about us. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, uh, of all of our hearts on this, your scripture reading, Lord, we pray that it would be beneficial to our lives and pleasing to you. O oh Lord, our God, our rock, and our redeemer. And all God's people said, amen. Today we are finishing the series that we've been doing together called Faith on Trial. We've been walking through the series where we've been talking about some of the objections, the questions, and the doubts that many people have about the Christian faith that perhaps you have had about the Christian faith. And we started really five or six weeks ago talking about some of the objections to the existence of God. We talked about some of the objections and the questions and the doubts about the Bible. We talked about some of our own sort of wrong conceptions about who God is and what God is actually like, and then we really focused in on what Jesus has to say about who God is, because that transforms all of our thoughts about what God is actually like. And then last week we looked at the most, probably one of the most emotionally powerful objections to God's existence, 
which is the objection of pain and suffering. That how can you believe in a good God when there's so much pain and suffering in the world? And, and if you want to catch up on any of that stuff, you can go to our YouTube page or you can go to the caledoniagathering.org, click on the message tab on the top, and you can find those messages there. But today we're going to wrap up with our final objection. If last week was the most emotionally powerful objection to God's existence, this week is what I think is probably the most popular objection to God's existence. Really an objection to the Christian church. The objection, as you can probably see from your paper, is hypocrisy. I don't know about you, but I've got plenty of friends, neighbors, I've had coworkers in the past, loved ones, who have said, I just can't bother with church. I can't even with Christians because all Christians are hypocrites. Perhaps you've thought that to yourself maybe at some point, that, that the church is just full of hypocrites and I don't want anything to do with, with those people. Actually, Alana and I had a bunch of people over uh, about a week and a half, two weeks ago, and I was talking to a guy on our back deck, and his reason for not coming to church, his reason for, for walking away from the Catholic faith that he, was, he grew up in was because he learned about ch church history. He learned about how Christians have behaved throughout history, and he said, I don't want anything to do with that. My objection to the Christian faith is is that the Christians are all hypocrites. Brendan Manning, who is an ex-Catholic priest and an author, um, gives this fantastic quote. And the reason I think it's fantastic is because it comes at the beginning of a DC Talk song. I don't know if anybody listened to DC Talk ever. No? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Angela. By the way, Angela got her house. Can we just give thanks to God for that? Angela has been trying to get a house in the area. She finally got a house. She got a condo. So we're really excited for that. Um, and she listened to DC Talk, which is great. <laughs> there's, a, there's a song by DC Talk called What If I Stumble? And, the, and uh, Brennan Manning's quote is right at the beginning of that song. And he, this is the quote. He says, the greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who praise Jesus with their lips and walk out the door to deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. I want to say that again because this is, I want this to stick with you throughout this morning's message. The greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians. It's not pain and suffering. It's not the philosophical explanation for God's existence. It's not the Bible. The greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who praise Jesus with their lips and then deny him by their lifestyle. That's what an unbelieving world simply finds un. Believable. And there really is no denying it. I mean, Christian history is full of hypocritical moments. There, there are no uh, shortages of examples to point to in the history of the church to point out our hypocrisy, Christians' hypocrisy. Often people, when using this argument, will point to things like the Crusades of the Middle Ages, when the Christian Holy Roman Empire expanded its borders, say, claiming Christianity, claiming to follow a Jesus who died for his enemies, and the way they lived that out was by expanding their territory and borders by cutting down and killing thousands of their enemies. In the 14th and 15th century, somewhere around there, especially in Spain, the Christian church put together a group of people, uh, you can kind of think of them as like quiz masters. And their job was to go around and find the new converts who had become pastors and teachers in churches and quiz them to make sure that they are not teaching false teaching, to make sure that they're not heretics. But at some point, that group of quiz masters went way off the rails and became what is known as the Spanish Inquisition. And they didn't just look for false teaching to correct false teaching in, in pastors and teachers in, in the churches throughout the area. No, no, they uh, tortured and killed anybody who thought differently than the Christian church. They tortured and killed hundreds of people who refused to convert from Judaism or Islam to Christianity and went way off the rails. Even think about in this country, slavery, a slavery based on, on race. The church was not immediately opposed to slavery based on race. In fact, the church was a part of it. 
participated it. And we're still trying to sort that mess out. I mean, history's filled with all kinds of, of hypocritical moments. Examples of when the church really didn't do what it said it was meant to do. That's really what hypocrisy is, right? You say one thing and then totally live another. There's not just historical examples. I mean, there are no shortages of examples in contemporary life as well, right? I mean, I just think about, uh, maybe you don't pay attention to church news, but I pay a little bit of attention to church news. I don't know how many major public figures, major uh, preachers and pastors of large churches in the area over the last year or so have had to step down from their jobs because of um, moral indiscretion, because of hypocrisy. Because they said one thing about sexual ethics and then they lived another. They said one thing about how to raise a family and then lived another. They said one thing about how to handle money, but they lived something totally different. I mean, the easy stuff to point to is all the abuse cover-ups in the Catholic Church, right? But there's something about Christians where we, we tend to be known as being judgmental. We tend to be known as being unloving, that we have a, a weird hatred towards minority groups. This is what Christianity is, is known for, is for being hypocritical. There's a study uh, done a couple of years ago. I want to read this so I get it right. Uh, this hurts a little bit, but Gabe Lyons, who wrote a book called Unchristian, pointed out a study that was done asking both Christians and non-Christians about their participation in the following activities. Gambling. Watching inappropriate online, online content. Saying something mean behind someone else's back. Stealing. Consulting a medium or psychic. Getting into a fist fight or physically hurting somebody. Abusing illegal or non-prescription drugs. Lying, revenge, and drinking beyond the legal limit to drive. Those ten items uh, was asked of Christians and non-Christians alike for their participation. There was no statistically significant difference between the activities of Christians and non-Christians. No statistically significant difference. The only statistically significant difference, actually, that came out of that study was that Christians happened to be less likely to recycle. Which is pretty outrageous. Really? Less likely? We're less likely to recycle? What becomes super clear, though, from a study like that is that Christians aren't necessarily morally any better than anybody else. We're not. In some sense, at least as far as the argument of hypocrisy goes, we're actually worse. Because as Christians, we say that we ought to live one way, and then we walk out the door and completely deny Jesus by our lifestyle. That's what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Now the question is, um, how do we answer? How do we answer a objection like that? How do you answer an objection to your friend, to your family member, to your coworker who who objects to Christianity based on the hypocrisy of the church? I don't want to go to church it's full of hypocrites. I don't want to be a Christian. A bunch of hypocrites. How do we respond? Well, um, two things. If you're taking notes. The first one is admission, admit. Second one is answer. First, admit. Secondly, answer a really important question. What I mean when I say admit, admit that it's true. The church is responsible for all kinds of horrible, bloody, terrible atrocities done throughout history. Christians have absolutely participated in violence and justice throughout history. It's true. It's true that the church is full of hypocrites. There's no getting away from it. There's no sliding out of the spotlight. We just have to admit it. It's true. But along with that admission, I think sometimes it, it might be important to add a little bit of qualifying. For example, the Crusades are often um, portrayed as, as an, a violent evangelistic tool that Christians in the Roman Empire went out and slaughtered anybody who wouldn't convert to their faith. Well, that's, that's sort of true, but sort of not. It's sort of, the truth is actually a little bit better, but also a little bit worse than that. The truth is the, the Roman Empire claimed Christianity and then went out to try and expand its political and geographical influence and its borders and its control. It tried to take back land that it had lost to other invaders. 
And so it doesn't really matter that they were Christians. If they were pagans or if they were some other religion, they still would have operated the same way. It doesn't actually make any difference. So it's not as though Christians have committed atrocities because Christianity teaches violence and injustice. That, that's really important. While Christians have been involved in violence and justice and injustice, Christianity doesn't promote and teach violence and injustice. So step one, admit where we've gone wrong in our lives. Admit where we've gone wrong as a church. But also, let's qualify some of the ways that that information's portrayed. Secondly, I think we have to answer the question, well then, why are there so many hypocrites in church? If, if we admit that it's true, why is that the case? Again, two points, if you're taking notes. The first one is faking it, and the second one is missing it. The church has hypocrites in it because, number one, some folks are just faking it. Maybe you're faking it. And believe me, I get it. Uh, especially in some of the culture that surrounds the greater Caledonia area, I'd understand if you were faking it. That if we sat down and, and, and had, a, had a drink, if we had a coffee, and, and I pressed you on it, if, that you might say, you know what, Corey, I'm actually not sure I believe. I, I, I'm actually kind of got my hand on the exit door. I'm just not ready to, to push and leave yet. Maybe you, if you're faking it, maybe you thought to yourself, you know, I just, there's so much cultural pressure. You do church, it's just what you do. Maybe there's so much family pressure. It makes sense that, that if you're faking it, you might, you might praise Jesus on Sunday, but walk out the door and deny him by your lifestyle because you just don't actually believe it. And by the way, if you are faking it, I'm glad that you're here. I really am. Um, secondly, not just faking it, but the church is full of people who are missing it. Missing it. And this is what I think is far more prevalent. The church is full of people who have traded in real Christianity for some sort of quasi-Christian religion. And this is actually what's going on in the city of Philippi that Paul, when we, wrote, wrote, we read from his letter that he wrote to a group of Christians who were lit, living in Philippi. This is what's going on there. You see, some Jewish teachers had heard about Jesus' resurrection from the dead and they believed him or they knew Jesus and they started following him. But the thing is, when you start following a new teacher and you start learning his ways of life, you don't immediately forget 30 years of the, your way of operating. Your brain is already set in how you're supposed to be in relationship with God and other people. So you might like Jesus' teaching, but you haven't quite switched over to his way of thinking, his way of loving and living. And so what happened was there were these Jewish people, these Jewish teachers, who were going around saying, yes, Jesus is good, yes, Jesus died for your sins, but you also need to become as passionate about following the Ten Commandments of Moses, as passionate about following all the hundreds of laws that come after the Ten Commandments from Moses. You need to become Jewish. You really have to, you know, you've got to get circumcised. Even if you haven't been yet, 30 years old or more, you've got to be circumcised. It's going to suck. Sorry about that. But you've got to be, you've got to be committed to the law. It's, it's not just Jesus. It's Jesus plus. Jesus plus the law. Jesus plus the celebrations. Jesus plus the Jewish holidays. Jesus plus the pilgrimage. It's Jesus plus you got to do these other things. And Paul gets super fired up about this. I actually, I, I absolutely, I absolutely love Paul's response. He goes on this massive, massive rant. It's almost like Paul says, really? Is that what you think? You think you can be in relationship with God because of the good stuff that you do? You think God wants to be in relationship with you because of all the talent you bring to the table? You think that that's why God is willing to be in relationship? That Jesus got you like a 50% off coupon, but you still have to pay the rest with good deeds? That Jesus kind of lifted you up to God, but you still have to reach and continue climbing the ladder yourself? Here's the problem, says Paul. That's trading real Christianity in for religion, and religion will always lead to hypocrisy. Here's why. Religion says this is what you need to do to get to God. 
here's what you have to do. Follow these rules, celebrate these holidays, make these pilgrimages, make sure you come to synagogue every Saturday, make sure you join a house gathering, make sure you, make sure you, make sure you, make sure you. These are what you have to do in order to be in relationship with God. It's about what you do. That leads to hypocrisy. Because nobody can keep the Ten Commandments perfectly. Nobody can keep those hundreds of laws perfectly. Nobody can do everything right all the time. Which means you end up being the kind of person who says, these are the things you have to do. I mean, I don't always do them, but these are the things you're supposed to do. I mean, that's, that's exactly what everybody hates the church for. Religion will always lead to hypocrisy. So Paul says, look, you, you can't live that way. I can't live that way. And trust me, if I can't live that way, none of you could. And then he goes on this huge rant. He's like, if anybody thinks they've got confidence to put in their own good deeds, to put in their own talent, I've got more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. That's the day God commanded. Remember that. I was circumcised on the right day. I'm one of the people of Israel. I'm not a Gentile. I'm not grafted in. I'm not an exception to the rule. I'm one of the original people. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. That's one of the most loved uh, sons of our father Jacob, tribe of Benjamin. It's also the tribe that gave Israel its first king. It's also the tribe that gave Israel its capital city, Jerusalem. That's from us. That's from my group. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. Even though I was born in Tarsus, don't be fooled. The Greek city doesn't matter. I have stayed Hebrew. I've never changed over. I never switched language to the Greek language. I never left the Hebrew law. I never left the Hebrew customs. Never left the Hebrew man way of life. Never left the Hebrew culture. And as for a law, I was a Pharisee. I was a member of the strictest sect of Judaism that there is. I was the best. I was held in the highest esteem by other people. I'm a passionate, uh, passionate keeper of the law of Moses. I was taught by one of the leading scholars of our day. And you want to talk about passion for our faith? I killed Christians. That's how passionate I am. And as for righteousness according to the law, except for the last part, I was blameless, completely perfect. Nobody could call me out for anything in my life. Religion, race, family, I had it all, I was it all, I did it all. And then I met Jesus. And I realized that none of that stuff actually got me there. That none of that stuff was actually making me good enough to be in relationship with God. None of that stuff was actually making up for all of the hidden ways in my own life that I was actually falling short. He says, I count it all loss. I count it all loss. I did, I still do, I always will count all of my talent, all of my good that I bring to the table. It's, it's well, our translation says garbage. I don't know if I've talked about this before. But the Greek word there is... Um, doesn't mean garbage. Uh, you can't say it in church. It's a cuss word. It's a crude word. It's a little bit surprising. This is how fired up Paul is about this attitude of being religious. The Greek word is skubala. You've, you've heard it before. Um, you, maybe you've seen it on the bumper sticker of the back of a car as skubala happens. Or uh, you ask somebody, how's it going? And they said, same skubala, different day. Or you, this weekend, are going to maybe knock a bra off the grill by accident and mutter scuba under your breath while you pick the bra up and put it back on the grill. Right? It's, it, none of the translators translate it that way because they knew there'd be kids in church. But that's how serious Paul is about this attitude that says that, that here's the stuff you need to do in order to get to God. That's how passionate he is. That all of the good things that he's done in his life, none of it could have made him right with God. None of it would have gotten him up the ladder. It's only Jesus. It's only him. It's trusting what Jesus has done. Paul says, he took hold of me. He took hold of me. That's real Christianity. I want you to hear me on this. If you walk away with nothing else, that's real Christianity. Trusting what Jesus did. 
Religion will always lead to hypocrisy. But real Christianity should lead to humility. So if your objection to Christian faith or the objection of your friends, your neighbors, your loved ones, your co-workers is that the church is full of hypocrites, admit it. Admit it and answer the question, well, why is that the case? Well, because we all suck. We do. None of us is good enough for God. But encourage them, and I am encouraging you to know, understand that Christianity is not about what you do to get to God, but it's about what God did to get to you. It's about what God did to get to you. And that should lead to humility in your life, not hypocrisy. If you are a Christian, you are a follower of Jesus, then I want to encourage you to, as Paul says, take hold of the salvation for which Jesus took hold of you. In other words, live into, it's pretty wordy, live into what Jesus did for you. The good news is you don't have a a list of 10 and then hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of applications of those big 10 rules to follow. You have one. When Jesus was gathered with his disciples in an upper room, and we talk about this a lot here, when Jesus was gathered with his disciples in an upper room, he said, this is how the world will know that you are my disciples. Not church attendance, not what family you came from, Not where you send your kids to school or where you went to school. Not what kind of job you work or how much money you give or all of the rest. This is how the world will know that you're my disciples. That you love one another. The way that I love you. If you want to follow Jesus, if you want to sort of make an attempt at at walking away from hypocrisy, trading hypocrisy in for humility, trading religion in for real Christianity. This is it. It's about what God did to get to you. And your response now is to love others the way that he has loved you. I just want you to consider for a few minutes at the end here what that might change for you. What does that change in in your marriage? If you think when you wake up in the morning, not... How is he meeting my needs? How is she doing the things I want her to do? How is, how is, how is? But instead, what does loving her look like when I think about the way Jesus loved me? Paul says right before this that that Jesus humbled himself in chapter 2. He says, he humbled himself. He put your interest ahead of his own, so much so that he was willing to go to the cross for you. That's what he did for you. To follow him is to love others with that same level of humility. So may we trade hypocrisy in for humility. May we trade our religious ways in for real Christianity. And may we love others the way that that Jesus really loved us. That's real Christianity. And I think that's what the world needs most. Not just in marriages, but in working relationships, in friendships, in partnerships, in business. That's what the world needs most, not just in the church, but in everyday life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. God, uh, I want to confess on behalf of all of us that we get this so backwards so often. That, that so often we um, not only make demands on ourselves, but that we make demands on other people uh, and we give a list of do's and don'ts, uh, a religion that's like a ladder and tell people to start climbing to get to you. But Lord, we know that the truth of Christianity is that in Christ you have taken hold of us already. By the blood of Jesus covering our sins, you have made us clean to stand in your sight. You've made our relationship with you just, just right. And we're so grateful for that this morning. Lord, I pray that you would make us into a humble church who seeks to love others, who seeks to change the perception of your people in the world today. 
not by grasping after power, not by cutting down our enemies, Lord, but, but for, by putting others ahead of ourselves, just like you did, by humbly loving others the way that you loved us. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.